quick one. Last video hit over 100 comments, which is absolutely mind-blowing for this channel. Let's try that again for this video. Comment down what you think about these stories, or just a hello, and the team will reply. We always reply to the comments. As always, please like and subscribe and help this channel grow. Thank you. The day I ended my toxic relationship was one of the hardest yet most liberating days of my life. As I packed up the last of my belongings from the apartment we had shared for the past two years, I took a deep breath and steeled myself for what I knew would be an ugly confrontation when my partner got home from work. Sure enough, when they walked through the front door that evening and saw the cardboard boxes and overstuffed suitcases lined up neatly by the door, ready to go, their expression shifted from surprise to anger faster than I could blink. How could I just abandon them like this without warning, they demanded. Didn't I know how much they needed me, rely on me? Didn't I care about them at all anymore? The accusations and emotional manipulation came hard and fast then, but I stood firm against the onslaught. It's over, I said simply when I could get a word in. Then I picked up my bags and walked out the door for the last time, leaving my stunned ex standing there amidst the ruins of our relationship. I had endured two long, lonely years of controlling, paranoid behavior from my partner. The constant monitoring of my phone and email the baseless accusations of infidelity whenever I so much as spoke to another person in public, the gaslighting and emotional abuse when I tried to call them out on their unhealthy attachment issues, the jealousy and isolation that cut me off from friends and family. I knew in my core that if I stayed, I would lose myself completely. So that I had walked away and I didn't look back. In the first few weeks after the breakup, doubts started to creep in. I wondered if I had made a terrible mistake. My ex left pleading, cloyingly sweet voicemails begging for another chance. They texted me dozens of times a day, fluctuating between desperately professing their love and angrily cursing me out for abandoning them. They even showed up on my doorstep more than once, sobbing pathetically and promising earnestly that things would be different if I just came back, that they would change for me. And oh, part of me wanted so badly to believe them. My bruised heart ached to go back to the comfort of what I knew, even if what I knew was toxic. There was still a traitorous thread of love left inside me, mingled inextricably with the pain. I started to wonder if I owed it to us both to try again. I knew my ex was right. Nobody would ever love me like they did. Maybe I was being selfish, cruel even, to refuse their appeals. I started to truly waver, wavering that threatened to unravel all the progress I'd made. But then the manipulation took a sinister turn. It started slowly at first, a strange email from an unknown account that nonetheless contained personal information that only my ex could know. Flashing calls from an unlisted number in the middle of the night, just long enough to wake me from a sound sleep before abruptly hanging up. Odd messages on my social media feeds that disappeared when I tried to view them. Over time, the ominous signs grew in frequency and intensity. Passwords for my email, social media, and even financial accounts were changed without my knowledge, locking me out of my own digital life. Private photos and information I had shared only with my ex began appearing online, though my security settings were locked down tight. Close friends and family members began receiving bizarre messages asking probing, personal questions about me and my new life apart from my ex. It was clearly a creeping campaign of terror and harassment, designed by my tech-savvy ex to destabilize and frighten me. I realized with dawning horror that they were leveraging all the intimate details and vulnerabilities I had confided in them over the years to wage psychological warfare against me. I felt violated, betrayed, hunted. I no longer had any sense of privacy or safety online or off. My ex had their claws dug deeply into every aspect of my digital life and seemed determined to poison me socially as well. I knew then that I could never go back, no matter how convincing the apologies and promises to change seemed. I also knew that giving in and responding to the harassment, even begging them to stop, would only feed into the twisted game my ex was playing. They wanted to control me again to burrow their way back into my heart and my life. The only way to win was not to play. So I locked everything down instead. I poured through account settings to maximize my security in every way possible. I cut off contact with anyone I thought my ex might have compromised as a way to get to me. I spoke with lawyers and law enforcement officers to explore my options and I simply continued moving through my days as if nothing was amiss. I gave my ex no indication that their terror tactics were having any effect on me whatsoever. I refused to satisfy their pathological need for control by reacting. Of course, feigning such nonchalance in the face of constant paranoia was incredibly difficult. 
It took every ounce of willpower I had to pretend I didn't feel their eyes on me everywhere I went, to resist constantly looking over my shoulder, to talk and laugh breezily with friends when inside I was a mess of frayed nerves and fear. But I knew that indulging my ex's sick game even for a moment would only make the nightmare infinitely worse. So I carry on. On the surface, I build a careful facade of calm normalcy, never letting on how unsettled I felt. All the while, behind the scenes, I worked relentlessly to strengthen the fortress of my new life. I changed accounts, beefed up security, cut off compromised connections. I focused single-mindedly on my job, on new hobbies, on renewing old friendships, and starting new ones. I would not allow this abusive, unbalanced ex who realized too late that I did not actually belong to them to cow me back into submission. My heart, my mind, my life were not theirs to suffocate in control any longer. It's been months now since I escaped the toxic fog of that relationship, yet still the provocations continue. The disturbing messages, the attempts to infiltrate my online spaces, the subtle signs I'm being watched, all reminders that my ex refuses to loosen their grip. I cannot control their terrifying behavior, only my own response. So I continue to show them just how little power they have left over me, that I'm not afraid of them anymore, that I will not give them the reaction they crave by engaging, that I am finally free. The road to complete escape from this nightmare continues, but so is my will to overcome it. I still bear scars from the years of manipulation and abuse I endured, but I survived and found myself again. And every morning that I wake up in my simple new home, surrounded by the growing signs of the life I'm building, is its own small victory. My abuser will not take that away from me. I've finally reclaimed my power, my independence, my sense of self. And with that strength flowing through me, I know I can withstand whatever storms still lie ahead. The darkness will not last forever. The light is coming for me, and I will walk into it with my head held high. I never could have imagined that my relationship with Terry would end the way it did. We had dated for five wonderful years, and I was convinced we would be together forever. I loved Terry with all my heart. Looking back now, I can see there were early signs that things between us weren't as rosy as they seemed. But I chalked it up to normal relationship issues that any couple faces. If only I had realized then what Terry was truly capable of. The first inkling that something might be off came a few months after Terry and I broke up, when I had just gotten engaged to my new fiancé, Emma. We were blissfully planning our dream wedding, touring venues, sampling cakes, and pouring over floral arrangements and centerpieces. As I made my way through the crowds at a local wedding convention, glancing at the dazzling displays, I suddenly spotted Terry lingering nearby, pretending to be a fellow bride-to-be. She made her way over to me and offered her congratulations, but there was an unsettling gleam in her eye that put me on edge. Over the next few weeks, I had several more odd run-ins with Terry at wedding planning events. She seemed to magically pop up wherever Emma and I went, from bridal boutiques to stationery stores. Terry would insert herself into our conversations, offering her disruptive opinions about cakes or decor. Her unwanted presence cast a pall over what should have been a joyous time. I started to grow suspicious, wondering if these coincidences meant Terry was deliberately tracking my movements. My doubts were confirmed when I caught glimpses of Terry following me through the grocery store and park outside my office building. When I confronted her, she pretended it was all a mistake. But the sightings became more frequent, and her excuses wore thin. It was clear Terry had become obsessed with monitoring my daily comings and goings. One Saturday, Emma and I arrived excitedly at an exclusive bakery for our cake tasting. We couldn't wait to sample the decadent flavors and finally envision the gorgeous confection that would be the centerpiece of our reception. But when we got there, the baker greeted us with a frazzled apology. There had apparently been an issue with our order and the cake they'd prepared was ruined. Though disappointed, Emma put on a cheerful face as the baker promised to whip up a new one. As we sat waiting, I noticed Terry lurking around the back, pretending to browse. When she saw me staring, she quickly slipped out the door. My heart sank, realizing Terry must have sabotaged our order somehow. The baker later confirmed a woman matching Terry's description had been loafing around their kitchen before our appointment, causing trouble. Rattled by the cake disaster, Emma and I began changing the locations for all our wedding planning meetings, desperate to avoid Terry's interference. But no matter where we went or how secretive we were with the details, she always managed to find us. The final straw came when Emma and I were reviewing invitation samples at a stationery store. The owner suddenly hurried over, regretfully informing us there had been a mistake. The invitations we'd chosen were now unavailable and reprinting would take weeks. 
One look at Terry's satisfied smirk through the window made it clear she was behind this latest sabotage. At that point, Emma and I were emotionally drained and defeated. Between all the stalking and Terry constantly ruining our plans, wedding planning had become a miserable experience. We decided to halt all preparations for a while just to regain our sanity. But Terry only seemed emboldened, continuing to haunt us wherever we went. She stoked my anxiety by sending cryptic messages about how she was always watching. Her relentless sabotage and stalking destroyed what should have been a joyous time in our relationship. Eventually, we involved the authorities, though they initially brushed off our concerns dismissing Terry as just an ex from the past. But after her behavior escalated from sinister pranks to outright threats, the police finally apprehended Terry and agreed to investigate. It turned out she had gone to frightening lengths, even bribing and threatening vendors to systematically ruin our wedding. Terry had become obsessed with making sure Emma and I didn't get a happy ending. The police discovered binders full of unhinged plans about how to sabotage us at every turn. The entire traumatic experience left Emma and me scarred and paranoid. We ended up postponing the wedding for months just to recover from the psychological damage of Terry's twisted vendetta. To this day, I still feel a lingering sense of unease whenever we're out in public, bracing myself for Terry to reappear. In retrospect, there were early red flags signaling Terry's controlling tendencies and capacity for obsession that I'd overlooked in my rose-colored love haze. I'm grateful we were eventually able to stop her crazed scheme before the damage was irreparable, but nothing can undo the shadow of Terry's madness cast over what should have been the most joyful chapter of our lives. My story stands as a cautionary tale. When things seem too good to be true, listen to your instincts, because sometimes happiness is only an illusion, obscuring the darker truths beneath the surface. I learned the hard way that people are not always as they first appear. Terry seemed loving and kind when we first met, but that facade hid something much more sinister. I hope others can learn from my stupidity and avoid finding themselves trapped in such a nightmarish situation. It started with my cat, Whiskers, my ex-partner, and I had adopted him together years ago, back when we were madly in love and utterly inseparable. Whiskers was our fur baby, the symbol of our perfect little family. We doted on that little tabby, showering him with affection, gourmet cat food, and far too many toys. He'd curl up between us at night, a contented purr rumbling from his belly. Adopting Whiskers together felt like the first step in building a life as a couple. So when we broke up after nearly five years together, the custody battle over Whiskers was the most painful and contentious part. I sobbed and pleaded, refusing to imagine life without my beloved cat. My ex fought just as hard, insisting Whiskers was more attached to them. After months of bitter conflict, we reluctantly agreed to join custody. I'd have Whiskers for a week, then they would take him for a week. It was an imperfect compromise, but the only way we could both stay in his life. The first few transitions went smoothly enough, but then the strange events started. One sunny afternoon, I came home from work to an empty, silent apartment. I called for Whiskers, checking all his favorite napping spots. No bright-eyed tabby appeared. My heart pounded as I searched everywhere, under beds, in closets, behind furniture. But Whiskers was gone. Frantic, I called my ex, but it went straight to voicemail. I left tearful message after message, begging them to bring Whiskers back, saying I'd do anything. But the hours stretched on with no response, no sign of my beloved cat. Dark scenarios flooded my mind. What if he'd gotten outside, hit by a car, stolen, hurt, and needing a vet? As the sun set, I sat hollowly on the couch, sobbing into Whiskers' favorite toy when the doorbell rang. I threw open the door to find Whiskers sitting calmly on the welcome mat, impeccably groomed as always. I scooped him into my arms, flooding with relief, but as I cuddled and kissed him, I'd noticed something off. Whiskers seemed thinner, almost gaunt. His eyes were dull and nervous, his fur matted in places. My poor baby, what had happened to him? When I confronted my ex demanding answers, they insisted they didn't know what I was talking about. They swore Whiskers had been perfectly safe and content with them. But their eyes glinted with an emotion I couldn't quite place. Satisfaction. Amusement. Cruel delight, whatever it was, I knew my ex was lying. The following week, the same thing happened. I came home to no cat, no response from my ex. Hours of panic and despair followed before Whiskers mysteriously reappeared on my doorstep. And once again, something seemed very wrong. 
This time, Whiskers flinched whenever I reached towards him, as if expecting to be struck. He refused to eat, drinking water obsessively instead. His fur was matted and dirty, claws ragged from scratching at something. My heart shattered realizing my ex was abusing our poor Whiskers. They were using his well-being to torture me, keeping me on edge and terrified. I confronted them again, but they insisted all was fine, feigning innocence with infuriating smugness. So the pattern continued, with Whiskers disappearing and reappearing at random intervals. Each time he seemed more damaged, skittish, clingy, aggressive, scared. My happy, affectionate cat had turned into a traumatized shell of his former self. I tried keeping him inside, locking windows and doors, but my ex always found a way to sneak in and take him when I was out. They were toying with me, using whiskers to keep me under their twisted control. My ex only escalated things from there. My car suddenly broke down the morning of an important meeting. My phone and laptop went missing, along with crucial work files. Expensive clothes were destroyed right before weddings and parties. These petty nuisances turned into full-blown sabotage, leaving my professional and personal life in shambles. At first, I chalked it up to bad luck, but the timing was always too convenient, the incidents too specifically targeted. My ex still had a key to my apartment from when we were together. They knew details about my schedule, friends, and plans that they used to meticulously ruin anything important. It was psychological warfare, a relentless campaign to keep me stressed, isolated and under their thumb. The harassment reached a peak when I started dating it again. I finally found happiness with someone new, a man who loved both me and Whiskers like family. We adopted another kitten, Rosie, to be Whiskers' new companion. For the first time in over a year, I was able to relax and feel secure. Naturally, my ex couldn't stand seeing me thrive without them. The day I planned to propose to my new partner, my ex sabotaged the entire event. They contacted all the guests I'd invited to our engagement party, spreading vicious lies and slander about me. On the big day, nobody showed up, leaving my boyfriend confused and hurt without knowing why. My special moment was completely destroyed. That was the final straw. I had to escape this toxic situation with Whiskers and Rosie before my unhinged ex could inflict more damage. So I packed what I could and fled to a friend's house across the state. It was an impulsive decision, but I was desperate. For a few precious days, life seemed calm. The cat settled in comfortably, relieved to be away from the stress and chaos. But the peace didn't last. A knock at my friend's front door sent my heart sinking. It was my ex with a cheerful smile and whiskers in their arms. They had tracked me down somehow, despite all efforts to disappear. My ex barged right into the house, playing the part of the concerned, accommodating ex. But their polite facade didn't fool me. I could see the vindictive gleam in their eyes, the subtle smugness at having found me. This went far beyond obsession or heartbreak. My ex was a full-blown predator, fixated on keeping me under their control no matter what, and they would continue using whiskers as a pawn to mentally torment me. Now I'm constantly looking over my shoulder, knowing my unhinged ex could reappear at any moment. I change locations every few days, but never feel safe. They made it clear this twisted cat and mouse game won't end until I'm completely destroyed. The savage glint in their eyes haunts me, a chilling threat that my life as I know it could be ripped away in an instant. I'm terrified of what they might do next to me or my innocent cats, but all I can do is try to stay one step ahead and brace for their next sadistic attack. This is my horrifying new reality, a life spent running from the toxic shadow of a vengeful ex who won't rest until they've taken everything from me. It all started when I broke up with my ex, Robin. We had been together for over two years and lived together for most of that time. At first, it was pure bliss. We were infatuated with each other and our relationship seemed perfect. But over time, little conflicts started adding up and we slowly grew distant. The loving gestures and deep conversations we once shared faded away. We stopped laughing together. Our love life fizzled. We were bickering more and more over insignificant things. It was painful to admit, but the spark had gone out. As much as it hurt, I knew I had to end it. The breakup conversation was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. Robin was blindsided and begged me to change my mind. She cried and tried to bargain, promising she could fix things between us. My stomach twisted in not seeing her so distraught, but I stood firm in my decision. I'd given this so much thought and knew in my heart this relationship had run its course. We both needed to move on. In the weeks following the breakup, 
We maintained a polite distance. I tried to give Robin space to process it all, though my heart ached picturing her alone in the apartment we once shared. I hoped in time we could eventually regain a friendship once the grief of the split wasn't so raw. It started with small oddities I at first dismissed around my new apartment. A misplaced fork or a closet door slightly ajar when I knew I had shut it. Pacing sounds from the apartment above late at night, even though I knew that unit was vacant. The hairs on my neck prickling unexpectedly, as if I was being watched from some unseen vantage point. I shrugged it off, assuming I was just overtired and restless in my new living situation. But the minor disturbances continued. Coming home to find my mail shuffled through kitchen cabinets sitting open that I swore I'd shut. Knocking sounds at the door when no one was there. My mind protested it was all in my imagination, but my gut said different. It was when I started catching glimpses of Robin that the fear began sinking in. Turning quickly at a flash of movement and just making out her silhouette vanishing around the hallway corner. Seeing her reflection in a window or mirror, only to find nothing there when I turned. I began dreading coming home or going to sleep at night, certain I'd find some new evidence of her unwanted presence. But each time I questioned my own sanity, wondering I was becoming paranoid. Still, the encounters increased. Robin lurking silently in the lobby when I entered my building. Sitting in her car outside my place, disappearing before I could confirm it was really her. Once even perched on my living room couch in the dark like she never left. Her expression unreadable, fading back into the shadows when I flipped on a light. My desperate calls to the police yielded frustratingly little. Without evidence, they assured me it was likely nothing. I knew deep down she was deliberately tormenting me. This was beyond grievance over the breakup. It had become an unrelenting stalking campaign. She was seeking revenge by making me feel vulnerable and powerless in my own home. Changing the locks didn't help, given her skill at picking them effortlessly. Installing security cameras only meant she found sneakier ways to continue haunting me. No matter what measures I took, she always found a way back in. Her passive-aggressive invasions increased in their boldness and persistence. My belongings gone through and rearranged. Strange messages left on my computer. A chilling college of photos of me stashed in a kitchen drawer. The feeling of being watched persisted no matter where I went. I withdrew socially, hesitant to leave my apartment in case she lay in wait. The final straw came late one night as I lay rigid in bed, listening to the faint creak of footsteps creeping down the hall toward my room. The doorknob slowly turned, the door inching open. My breath froze in my chest as Robin's silhouette filled the doorway. That clip from the hall. Her presence oozed menace as she stood motionless, staring at me in the dark. The unspoken threat in the air was palpable. At that moment, I knew escape was my only option. As soon as I found a new apartment, I moved out with zero notice. I left nearly everything behind, unwilling to take any possessions she could have tampered with. I cut off all ties, changed my number, established a security routine. But I knew she could find me if she wanted to. Settling into my new place, I still couldn't shake the unease. Had I gotten away clean, or was she somehow watching me here too? I hid my location from everyone I knew in case she got it out of them. I kept obsessive notes on any unusual occurrences, wary of her possible return. I tried to rebuild some sense of normalcy, but the damage was done. She had succeeded in making me a prisoner in my own mind, and as much as I tried to feel safe again, the fear of her clinging to my psyche, knowing no place was truly beyond her reach. When my relationship with my ex ended, I never could have imagined the living nightmare that would follow. The breakup itself was traumatic, full of fiery accusations of betrayal and lies hurled from both sides. By the end, the toxicity had reached unimaginable levels. I was utterly drained, both emotionally and physically. The constant screaming matches, the cruel jabs designed to tear down my self-worth, the manipulation disguised as affection. It had warped my sense of reality until I no longer recognized myself. I thought I had finally broken free from the abuse and could start healing. But the panic attacks that jolted me awake each night and the paranoia creeping into every thought told a different story. My ex still had a psychological hold over me. In hopes of finding support and guidance to process the trauma, I decided to join a local survivors group. I noticed a flyer advertising their free weekly meetings at my therapist's office. The flyer mentioned providing a judgment-free space for individuals recovering from abusive relationships. At that point, I was so emotionally exhausted and still played by lingering feelings of self-blame. I hoped that being surrounded by others with similar experiences would help me feel less alone in my pain. 
The first meeting was comforting. Seeing the empathy in the eyes of those who understood the unique trauma of intimate partner abuse made me feel seen. We sat in a circle in the cozy counseling office, sipping coffee under dimmed lights as we shared our stories one by one. When it was my turn to speak, I confided about the extreme isolation I had endured. I explained how my ex methodically cut me off from friends and family, intercepting texts and voicemails until I was wholly dependent on them. The other members nodded knowingly as I described the mounting confusion and self-doubt when my lived experiences were denied and distorted by gaslighting. For the first time in a long while, I felt a sense of validation instead of the confusion my ex worked so hard to instill. The group gave me hope that with support, I could untangle the web of lies I've been trapped in and regain my sense of self. Little did I know that hope would soon unravel into an even darker chapter of the nightmare. My ex had followed me to the group and joined using a fake name and appearance. They wore big framed glasses and added highlights to their hair, taking on a meek demeanor. It was an unnerving yet convincing facade concealing their abusive tendencies. While I sat there sharing my deepest pain, my tormentor was sitting just feet away silently hatching a scheme. In the sessions that followed, I noticed a dynamic shift in the group. One member in particular, who I learned was named Alex, questioned and doubted my stories. This supposed sympathetic supporter was none other than my manipulative ex. Their undermining started subtle, but grew bolder each week, edging on gaslighting. They would wait for me to share a painful memory from their relationship, then feign concern while asking leading questions to imply I was misremembering or overreacting. I started to notice other members nodding in agreement with Alex's accusations dressed up as constructive feedback. My ex knew how to strategically twist the narrative just enough to erode my credibility. During a discussion on trauma bonding, I would end up about how my ex would inflict cruelty followed by affection as a means of control. Alex waited for me to finish, then mused about how abusers can be unaware of their actions if emotions are running high. Their words cast my ex's egregious behavior as a mere overreaction, suggesting both parties were at fault. I was left doubting and blaming myself all over again. Piece by piece, my support system was being turned against me through my ex's deceptive performance. Week after week, they conjured up manipulated versions of our past under the guise of sharing their own trauma. With no evidence but their convincing emotional pleas, the other members bought into the fabricated accounts. My ex utilized their knowledge of my vulnerabilities to paint me as the unstable and violent one. At the very same time I was working to break free, my ex was laying the groundwork to regain control. I could feel myself shrinking during each session as doubts were planted by my ex's intricate web of lies. I was starting to question if I truly could trust my own memories and perception. My ex had crafted an entire alternate history where they were the helpless victim, leaving out any context of the abuse. The other members, oblivious to my ex's duplicity, encouraged Alex's claims and saw me as irrational any time I tried to defend myself. Just as I was nearly depleted of hope and strength, convinced I had no ally left, another group member named Rebecca approached me. She had observed inconsistencies in Alex's accounts and saw through the innocent facade. Rebecca had noticed something that gave her chills. Alex would smile smugly whenever I became emotional. She told me she suspected Alex was an abuser manipulating the group, and we started piecing together a plan. Rebecca came with me to the next session prepared to root out the sinister charade. When Alex spun another tall tale painting themselves as the victim, Rebecca pushed back with pointed questions while I presented hard evidence contradicting the timeline. My ex stammered and backpedaled, but their mask had finally slipped. The other members recoiled as the magnitude of deception set in. In the end, the truth prevailed over my ex of brazen lies. Though some group members understandably felt betrayed, many apologized for doubting me and not recognizing the manipulation sooner. They surrounded me with empathy and validation they should have offered all along. I emerged with the knowledge my inner voice could be trusted again, feeling empowered instead of silence. My ex of depravity reinforced how cunning emotional abuse can be, but sharing this trauma bonded me closer with others who endured similar manipulation tactics. I refused to allow my ex's darkness to overshadow my light. And when intrusive thoughts resurfaced questioning what was real, I anchored to the solidarity and compassion I found with those who stood with me in the end. Though my path ahead is still daunting, I am reminded I don't need to walk it alone. I thought I was finally moving on and had put the whole thing behind me. But then, one day out of nowhere, I got a message from my ex saying they needed to talk to me urgently. 
At first, I didn't want to get sucked back into their drama and ignored it, but they kept messaging me insistently saying it was extremely important. Eventually, my curiosity got the better of me and I reluctantly agreed to meet up. When I saw my ex, I was shocked at their disheveled appearance. It was clear something was very wrong. They proceeded to tell me they had contracted some rare and serious illness. According to them, it had been going on for months with worsening symptoms, and the doctors had run multiple invasive tests, MRIs, and procedures, but still couldn't figure out what was wrong. They showed me a big stack of papers that looked like authentic medical reports filled with medical jargon. I'm no doctor, but it looked real. My ex went into graphic detail about all their symptoms, severe fatigue, unexplained pain, calcified lesions. It sounded awful and my natural empathy kicked in even though we were no longer together. That my ex dropped the bombshell that they suspected they had gotten the illness from me when we were dating. My first reaction was total shock and confusion. But then my ex started rattling off all these symptoms I never knew about that I had when we dated. Headaches, joint pain, fatigue. Hearing it all laid out, I started to worry they might be right, even though I felt fine now. What if I unknowingly carried something and passed it to them? What if I had it too, but just didn't know? My mind was reeling. The thought that I could be sick too made my stomach drop. My ex insisted they just wanted to warn me so I could get checked out, not to make me feel guilty. They went out about how scared they were, how the doctors didn't know how to treat it, and how they didn't know what to do anymore. I could see plain anguish on their face. Part of me still resented how things ended between us, but I also felt bad that they were going through this health nightmare. I decided I had to know if I had this mystery illness too and immediately booked a doctor's appointment to get tested. But the uncertainty plagued me. Waiting for the test results was agonizing. I couldn't concentrate at work and felt distracted and anxious all the time. Thoughts about having some terrible disease took over and I descended into full-blown health anxiety. My mind spun out of control thinking about all the horrible ways this could go. The weeks dragged on without any update from my doctor. My ex kept calling for any news. They sounded more desperate each time, saying how rapidly they were declining. Hearing their worsening condition evoked my empathy again, even though I knew I shouldn't let them manipulate me. I started regretting ever agreeing to the tests. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, I got my test results back showing a completely clean bill of health. I was overcome with relief but also utterly confused. I immediately called my ex demanding an explanation. After trying to keep up the act, they finally broke down and admitted it was all an elaborate ruse to try and get me back in their life. Those medical papers were fakes. The symptoms were lies. It was chilling to realize the lengths my ex went to in order to deceive me. I was livid and unleashed all my anger about the hell they had just put me through. How could someone be so manipulative and cruel? I told them to never contact me again and that we were forever done. But over the next few weeks, my ex only got more desperate. Showing up at my work, lurking outside my home, begging me to forgive them. They kept insisting they only did it because they loved me and made a mistake, but I didn't buy any of it after that betrayal. No matter how much I told them to leave me alone, my ex persisted with their unhinged behavior. I was constantly looking over my shoulder, paranoid they were following me. I stopped being able to sleep and was plagued by panic attacks set off by constant anxiety. Work, friends, everything suffered because of the mental toll. The harassment went on for months, no matter how much I pleaded to be left in peace. As a last resort, I had to get the police involved to threaten my ex with legal action if they contacted me again. It worked briefly, but then the onslaught of messages and attempts to see me started back up, each time more frantic sounding. My ex was clearly spiraling out of control and was afraid of what they were capable of doing next. I knew I had to take more drastic action. In the end, I had to completely uproot my whole life. New location, new job, new phone number. I cut off contact with mutual friends, anything that could lead my ex to me. The level of disruption and fear I experienced took a massive toll on my mental health. I ended up needing therapy just to process it all. It's been almost a year now since I went off the grid and I'm still constantly paranoid my ex will reappear and start this nightmare all over again. I don't know if I'll ever fully recover from the emotional trauma inflicted on me. It started slowly at first, just small changes to my routine that I barely even noticed. A different route to work in the morning. The barista at my regular coffee shop calling me by name I was certain I had never told her. 
The feeling that the familiar faces in my apartment lobby were staring just a little too long as I hurried past them to the elevator. Little things that barely even registered in my conscious mind. I brushed them off, assuming it was just the ordinary chaos of life in the city playing tricks on my brain. But over time, the incidents became more frequent, more obvious, impossible to ignore. I began catching glimpses of a familiar car trailing behind me during my commute. I would spot it weaving through traffic two or three cars back, pace for pace. Just close enough for me to make out the color. A deep forest green, just like the one my ex had driven when we were together. I told myself it had to be a coincidence. That city was huge and green was a common color. But then I would see that green car park outside my gym when I left my morning workout class. Or across the street from my favorite cafe on a lazy Sunday morning. Always keeping a measured distance, but undeniably there. Watching me. It finally came to a head one night when I was driving home from visiting a friend across town. The feeling of eyes on the back of my neck prickled stronger than ever, and this time, I knew with chilling certainty that it was not my imagination. Checking the rearview mirror, I could plainly make out a pair of headlights that had been behind me for the past ten minutes, keeping perfect pace. As I took an abrupt last-second exit, the car followed without hesitation. There was no denying it anymore. I was being followed, stalked. My suspicions were confirmed over the next few days as signs of my exit presence became more and more overt. Items would go missing from my home, only to reappear days later in bizarre places. My mail was inexplicably open before I saw it. Personal belongings ever so slightly out of place. My ex had clearly been accessing my space and my belongings without my knowledge or permission. I knew I had to take action before things escalated even further. I installed cameras and new locks told family and friends what was happening in case I ever went missing. Went to the police to make a report, though they said there was little they could do without evidence of a crime. I did everything I could think of to reclaim a sense of safety, but nothing seemed to work. If anything, the unsettling incidents only increased after my attempts to lock my ex out. Key possessions would disappear for days only to reappear in my desk drawer at work. Strange messages would be scrawled on my apartment windows despite being on the fifth floor. My ex was making it abundantly clear that there was nowhere they couldn't access if they wanted to. I could hardly sleep at night, plagued by the panic thought that my ex could enter my home at any time if they wanted to. I had become a prisoner in my own home, my every move monitored from afar. I stopped going to places I used to enjoy for fear of being ambushed. Grocery shopping or grabbing coffee with friends became anxiety-inducing ordeals, being constantly on guard for a surprise appearance. The months of unrelenting stalking and surveillance took an immense toll on my mental health. I was startled by every stray movement or odd noise, my nerves completely frayed from the relentless stress. I withdrew from friends and hobbies more each day, too exhausted and paranoid to focus on anything but basic survival. I became a shadow of my former self, anxious, isolated, afraid. Just when I had reached the breaking point of considering drastic measures just to escape, I realized I had to make a choice. Either I could let the abuse, fear, and trauma continue to control and destroy my life, or I could take a stand and refuse to hand over my power. It was far from easy, but I knew getting up more of myself to this torment was not the answer. With the unwavering support of loved ones, I found the strength to begin taking small steps to rebuild the life that had been stripped away from me. I reconnected with old friends, returned to the activities I once enjoyed, and took all precautions I could to protect myself and my home. It was incredibly difficult at first, with setbacks and panic attacks aplenty. But gradually, the small victories began to accumulate. Today, with time and distance from that horrifying situation, I can look back with a deep sense of gratitude for having survived. I am thankful for the lessons about my own strength and resilience that I learned. I did not take lightly the work it took to get here, or how close I came to losing myself completely. Most of all, I am proud of the person I have fought so hard to become. Someone who has been battered and frightened but has never given up. Someone who knows the meaning of true courage in the face of fear. The experience left scars without a doubt, but it could not take away my spirit or my determination to overcome. I still carry a heightened sense of vigilance with me out of necessity. But I will never again allow another person to dictate the terms of my existence or take away my freedom. The past will always be part of me, but does not define my future. I am in control now of my life, my choices, my destiny, and nothing will ever change that again.
When I received that first message from our mutual friend asking me to support Vivian's new charity, I didn't think much of it. I figured it was just a passing idea, something she was dabbling in momentarily to distract herself after our breakup. I had no idea how deeply obsessed and committed she would become with this endeavor, using it as a front to continue manipulating me long after our relationship ended. Looking back now, I see the signs were there early on. The charity seemed suspiciously focused for someone just getting started, almost like Vivian had been meticulously planning every detail prior to ever mentioning it. The way our friend spoke so effusively about her supposed good works immediately raised red flags. Their enthusiasm bordered on fanatical, as if they had been utterly spellbound by Vivian's vision. I realized she must have spent considerable time getting them invested well before I ever heard a word about any of it. Once I declined making a sizable donation, the barrage of messages from friends refusing to take no for an answer should have been my first clue that this ran much deeper than just fundraising for a cause. The peer pressure mounted week after week until it became a constant din I couldn't ignore. Each conversation was an eerie echo of the last, using similar phrasing and making the same emotional appeals. I started noticing a distinct pattern to their manipulation, mentioning childhood memories we shared, bringing up inside jokes from our past, pontificating about the moral imperative to help those in need. Vivian knew which heartstrings to pluck with each person to elicit maximum sympathy and loyalty. When she first showed up unannounced at my office, I was admittedly shaken, but also strangely unsurprised. Of course, she would find new ways to insinuate herself into my life again, despite my repeated requests for distance and privacy. As she waxed poetic about her grand plans for transforming mental health care in our city, I searched her face for any glimmer of the person I used to know. But behind the facade of smiles and idealism, I saw only chilling single-minded determination. Her only goal, thinly veiled beneath ostensible altruism, was maintaining control over me by any means necessary. In hindsight, going to the police probably wouldn't have deterred Vivian at all. If anything, it likely would have added fuel to her obsessive fire, providing another perceived injustice for her to rally against in her quest to make me bend to her will. Any reasonable boundaries I tried to enforce she construed as a personal attack that justified her unrelenting harassment disguised as advocacy. Each unwanted gift left at my door or social media notification was a reminder that she could still dictate the terms of our relationship. Vivian's facade of selfless activism provided the perfect cover for her continued abuse. Who could accuse someone devoting their life to such a noble cause? Even as I withered under the pressure of her manipulations, no one else seemed to detect any ulterior motives beneath her saccharine veneer of virtue. Only I could see the scarcely contained rage behind her eyes any time I challenged her narrative. When I finally made the excruciating choice to uproot my entire life just to escape, I mourned not only the loss of friends and community, but also the person I thought Vivian was. In the years since, I've slowly begun piecing parts of myself back together, though I remain wary of getting too comfortable again. Vivian exploited my closest bond to suit her agenda, leaving me reluctant to trust and unable to look back on much of our shared past without bitterness. But the creeping dread and hypervigilance have gradually subsided, allowing room again for hope. I wish I could say her sinister scheming was an anomaly, but others should know the darkness that can emerge when a relationship ends badly. My story is a caution against ignoring the red flags and writing off problematic behaviors as harmless idiosyncrasies. I am thankful to now be free, but I will never forget. The emotional scars from Vivian's abusive behavior after our breakup have taken a long time to heal. For months, I found myself constantly looking over my shoulder, half expecting her to find new ways to forcibly insert herself into my life against my will. Her so-called charity was a perfect disguise to enable her harassment under the guise of virtue. She and I would hesitate to speak out against such seemingly benevolent work allowing her an opening to leverage our mutual connections in manipulating me. I tried to give her the benefit of the doubt at first. Maybe this nonprofit was her way of channeling the pain from our split into something positive. But it rapidly became clear that her only motivation was maintaining proximity and control. Any reluctance I expressed toward being involved was met with a barrage of guilt trips and accusations of not caring about worthy causes. She portrayed basic boundaries as callous indifference to the suffering of others. I soon realized she only cared about her own suffering and losing me. In putting up with Vivian's behavior for too long, I learned difficult lessons about listening to my instincts when someone shows you who they really are. There were so many telling actions I brushed off in hopes that our shared history would prevail. 
The combative way she responded any time I disagreed with her plans was a red flag. The fact that she seemed totally unfazed by my refusal to donate should have signaled she had an ulterior agenda. I let my desire to avoid conflict blind me to the blatant warning signs. Part of me wishes I had been more direct in calling out Vivian's true motivations, rather than quietly trying to distance myself. But honesty only enraged her further in the past. She was adept at evading accountability with tears and playing the victim. I had to accept that I alone could not get through to someone so committed to distorting reality to suit her needs. Removing myself from her sphere of influence was the only way to regain autonomy. Though painful, cutting ties with formerly close friends proved necessary for self-preservation. Vivian had thoroughly enmeshed them in her warped narrative, casting me as the villain. They could no longer see her with clear eyes, too invested in her supposed righteousness. I had to mourn these relationships along with the one I thought we had. Some wounds heal slowly, but time and distance have offered perspective. While I still carry some residual distrust, I refuse to let Vivian's toxicity permanently taint my ability to connect meaningfully with others again. Her unhinged obsession does not define all relationships. While the gifts of getting free is reclaiming my capacity for openness, no longer viewing it as a liability. I'm stronger now in guarding my boundaries while still embracing vulnerability. Never again will I ignore the red flags when someone reveals their true nature. My heart won freedom is proof enough that with courage, the darkness can be overcome. Thanks for listening in. If you like these stories and want to hear more, then please subscribe and like and support this new channel. We have more stories for you to listen to.